Well, in our last tutorial, we looked at some of the major common world views that James Sire describes as a result of his applying the eight broad questions about worldview to the overall human view of life. And, and they, that we saw that those applied in many different societal contexts. Now, this second set of worldview issues that we'll be talking about and describing We'll, we'll talk about in terms of a less formalized that model, the one that began from Wilkins and Sanford with the story at the center. And we said that the story develops uh, an identity, so that in, on the basis of a story, an identity for an individual is developed, which in turn, the outworking of an identity tends to be a set of convictions that create then in, in their turn values and ethics, so ways that People define the priorities, the things that they believe that are the most important to do in, their, in the course of their day-to-day -day lives. And then on the basis of those ethics, the morals and actions are the actual doing that is a result of the activities of, of what's built from that story, what's built through that identity, what's built through the convictions and values uh, in the process of a life being lived out in a particular cultural or social context. So these two authors are, are saying also that we don't take in worldviews as formalized, rigid systems that are presented to us as human beings in cohesive and coherent packages. And then we intellectually evaluate each one and make a decision to accept one or another. That, that almost never happens. That wouldn't be the way that worldviews would be typically adopted by human beings. They're, they're more adopted in a piecemeal or an informal way and, and in the process of, of being adopted in a sense through enculturation and through societal pressure and societal change. Those worldviews themselves in the mind of a human being, they're changing, they're morphing, they're growing, they're shrinking and expanding in different areas. And based on the, the influences of, a, of, of life in a personal story, in a society, in a, in a cultural context, those worldviews are developing that way. And so these cultural influences that we see in the lives of human beings, they have a high degree of, of involvement and interaction uh, with that process of worldview formation. And so now we're going to look at the set of categories then, this more informal set of categories to think about worldview and worldview formation. These worldview categories, we'll see very quickly, are not um, based on the historical de philosophical development or on the comparative religious idea that we, we explored with Sire. Uh, so he compares Hinduism and Islam and, and the Christian worldview in comparison to deism or all of those kinds of ideas, the big, broad, historical or philosophical development categories of comparative religion. And so here we're talking about worldviews from Wilkins and Sanford uh, that describe some of the threads or streams of life in Western society by which human beings, as they interact with the social and cultural pressures around them, they, they define what ultimately redeems or brings meaning to existence and that idea of salvific or redemptive purpose will be will be a, a, a very important part of the discussion that we have because many of these things are they're informal they're bought into because they are the societal or even political at times influences that are driving the society the thought process that that covers the societal development in a particular time and Therefore, they're not necessarily developed as rational. They're rational, but not necessarily a rationally coherent system of response. Um, there, there's, there is a certain way to try to eliminate contradiction between the components, and therefore it's an acceptance of a societal idea or development to try to justify or reconcile those potential contradictions between life experience and what gives ultimate purpose and meaning. And, and, and even in that sense, as we've said several times now, they're, they're very informal. They're very much culturally derived. And these authors make a very good point that, that the church as an institution is not at all immune 
to these kinds of worldview influences. In fact, the church is very much affected, and believers are very much affected in ways that, in retrospect, that could surprise us. And so if we're not careful to be continually evaluating our lives, we'll find ourselves unknowingly at times buying into key components or themes or threads of these, these informal worldviews. Now, this is, this is important for us, uh, not only as overseas workers, but as believers in any societal context, because we want to live a story that's purposed, that, that's an outworking of God's great story, His, his meta narrative, His great narrative. We don't want to be surprised one day by the fact that we were promoting something, for example, something is, and I think about the example of slavery in the context of history, that that Christians actually were involved in the promotion of, and then to find that it's inconsistent, that that practice is extremely inconsistent with, with a true understanding of Christian theism or truly Christian worldview, that those societal themes or pressures don't take us by surprise, such that uh, we really, as believers, are regularly evaluating and understanding what it is that our worldviews do consist of in daily, regular practice. So we're going to look at some of these worldview categories then, and not, not using, in this case, Sire's eight questions, but rather from the point of view of the descriptive um, text in Wilkins, Wilkins and Sanford, and um, looking at the, the minimal or, or the most important components that help to drive these themes forward in the societies where we live today. And again, as an opportunity for us to, to bring some reference points that are evaluative for us as we think about our worldview experience and the influences that are affecting us, that are impacting us. And so we'll begin then with the idea of individualism. And that's not a new concept for, I trust, for most of us, but the idea there that, that ultimately the individual self, the individual person, is at the center of meaning and purpose. That my happiness, my fulfillment is at the center. And there is a salvific nature to each of these ideas that salvation in this case, salvation in a secular sense, is found in my being happy, that that is my fulfillment. My salvation is my happiness. As those who may be American citizens, for example, we see in the American Constitution and even other documents that that stemmed from Europe and other places that those deists like Thomas Jefferson who wrote there and Uh, Many Christians, in fact, quote, even though these guys were deists and a lot of their philosophy we wouldn't be able to buy into, but they they upheld that strong sense of individualism, that the pursuit of happiness, as written in the Declaration of Independence from the U.S. perspective, is is a divine right. It's a right. And and therefore becomes something that can drive society forward and and be a pragmatism, uh, even a the idea of our leveraging our relationships for an ulterior motive of our, of our own fulfillment and purposes. In our business models, in capitalistic business models, we see that being the case. In, in Christian community, we hear talk of that sort of thing, where the individual fulfillment allows you to use and even abuse relationships with others in order to achieve that happiness objective. And, and we should be alarmed by that, and, and some of us are aware of it. And, so in this particular area, this idea of individualism, then, we're defined at the center. And that can create a, a, a pragmatism that, that says what is in my best interest as an individual is, is ultimately what is best. And that means that I'm going to have to navigate and operate in the context of my political and social environments and get along with others, but ultimately I'm doing that following my rules of personal business because if I don't, um, you know, I'll I'll face consequences. In case of true business, maybe go to prison for not following enough of the rules and guidelines, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm still doing ultimately what's best for me as an individual. 
Now that's a very strong value in a lot of our Western societies in many countries. That affects Christians and can create a relative standard of right and wrong in practical terms for people. Because at the end of the day, my life is about what's best for me. What I can get away with even, unfortunately. And, and so individualism there says that salvation as an idea is found in the fulfillment of my, my personal identity, my happiness, uh, my, uh, my ends and goals forwarded and, and completed. So that individualism that we're describing then is one of the major threads or themes that creates an identity for people in many of our societies. And a second major category that we also see in Western society is, is a consumerism that ultimately our identity is defined by what we have, what we own. It can be subtle, but, but it is indeed very strong in, in the societies where we live, that the idea of, of even branding and advertising, the, the association of the story and the identity of a person with the things that they possess, the own, that they own, the, the brand that my shoes are, the, the things that are, that are in my house that represent a certain level of status, the, the kinds of cars that we drive and the ways that those cars look, the, the clothes that we wear. This kind of consumerism, as Wilkins and Sanford describe, it, it's a, is a major issue that motivates and drives forward the con convictions and values that we hold to. And, and it can become very, very similar to a means of salvation or redemption in the sense of our finding purpose in our stories through a type of consumerism, that our identity is defined on the basis of, of the fulfillment provided by my showing off what I own and what I possess. And, and that becomes the associative identity point for me. It's, it's very crazily non-Christian, very much evident that that's a non-Christian sentiment. But we as believers, we see we buy into this all the time in places around the world, that in the church itself, in Christian circles, in Christian society, that, that the pomp and circumstance of, of competing with the neighbors for the nicer car, the nicer house, the nicer boat, the better retirement option, the, the nicer clothes, the, the better looking family, whatever the case may be, that that kind of consumerism very much impacts and affects Christian life. And as we describe these worldviews, just keeping in mind our biblical response to them, uh, what, what is an appropriate biblical response to, to an individualism or, or a consumerism? What, what would God have us to do in light of the story that he has? Uh, another area that, that these authors uh, describe that rings true for us is, is nationalism. That perhaps in American context, that nationalism is more of an influence maybe than in Australian or British culture or other cultures, but... A nationalism that would say, more than anything, my particular nation under God's providence or care. As Bob Dylan said, I think of the song where he wrote, that those who go to war feel like they're going to war because clearly God is on our side, not on the side of the rest, but on our side. A conflict in which one country doesn't have the ability to claim God on their side, whereas the, the, the other nation may, may feel, well, we have God on our side, so we have a greater likelihood of being victorious in this situation. In reality, any, any time there's a national nation-to-nation -nation conflict, no one is going out with, with the, the statement that's saying, hey, it's not in our destiny to win. And ironically, in the same competition or, or conflict, two different people praying and depending that God is intervening for their particular nation to help them to be successful even in a war and a conflict. And so in our American societies, we hear that kind of reiteration, this, this strong relationship and connection between a conservative political philosophy and a conservative religious philosophy that, that would be closely tied together and, and would suggest that if I am religiously conservative, 
that, um, that, that God indeed can be claimed to be backing my political philosophy even. And, and uh, so nationalism as an idea becomes a part of, of the very fabric of Christian identity in many situations in America because we are closely aligning uh, our manifest destiny as a nation with God's divine protection or purpose for us. And, and Wilkins and Sanford, very much tongue-in-cheek, they point out several areas where uh, if you are viewing the divine destiny of, of a particular government in that kind of a way, that you're actually probably a nationalist. They, they, I, I appreciate the way they present that. It would be good for you to look at. That if you think that God's eternal plan will be derailed if your country's role is diminished in, let's say, the next 25 years, that, that you may actually be a nationalist. And so they're helping us to, to identify those kinds of areas of, of nationalism in our lives. Our identities, even as Christians, can be become defined by our nationhood or um, our country's um, patriotism in a sense, that our, our salvation is defined by that. And so if my nation, for example, is not in the driver's seat, then, then the meaning, meaningfulness or fulfillment of my life is less. Uh, that's, that's something that politicians and others in our societies talk about and, in fact, intentionally promote. And we as Christians needing to be on guard of, about that kind of a worldview theme or philosophy in our societies. And you can see the way that the informal nature of our social context, cultural context, create uh, an environment where those kinds of ideas can be propagated and many times in, in a way that we, are, we don't recognize, that we're buying into a philosophy like that without recognition of it. So those are three of the, of the common worldview areas that Wilkins and Sanford introduce. And they go on then to introduce a fourth, which is common to us because of our discussion pre previously of postmodernism, which is the idea of moral relativism. Now, we know that relativism says, suggests that there is no absolute truth, that the, the common uh, objection to relativism is that it claims absolutely that there's no absolute truth, which seems to be a contradiction. But the, by saying there is no right and wrong except for that, which is absolute, that it's absolutely right for me to tell you there's no right and wrong. So we know that that's, that's a strange um, challenge that relativism faces, but nonetheless, the, the, that circular thinking has not stopped the theme or threat of relativism from really pervading our societies. It's very prevalent for us. The, the guilt that is placed on us, even as believers, and it's maybe even especially as believers, that if we defend truth, we, defined, we define absolutes, that, um, that, we're, that we're really contradicting our societies and the norms of our societies, that as we watch TV and we see in the media the things that we read that are publicized, the conversations that we have, that, that if you're not holding very loosely and humbly to your statements of absolutes and truth, then, then you're an arrogant person that it has no business, no, no privilege to talk and, and no privilege to deal with people. You, you, that, we, that we even as believers are under this obligation to, to accept a relativism that mutes our voice and that, that we don't have the, the right or privilege to, to try to impose a statement about value or truth on, on another person. That, that, that is indeed the characterization that, that often gets made about us as believers. And again, the challenge for us to recognize what, what is an appropriate biblical response to that. Are, are we even aware of the danger of that philosophy permeating and muting our voice or making us um, conscious to the degree that we, we aren't willing to speak up in appropriate ways in the societies where we live? Another of the worldviews that Wilkins and Sanford, the informal or lived-in worldviews that they talk about, connects to the, the naturalism that, um, that James Sire talks about, what we would describe as scientific naturalism. 
that says that only matter matters. And, and Wilkins and Sanford are stating that they, they don't want to include all of that comparative religion in their study because it's too long, but um, science, scientific naturalism is, is, is a theme or thread of thought that permeates society in, in an informal way even by suggesting still that if there's a salvation for mankind, that the, the vehicle for that is science. That, that ultimately meaning and fulfillment will be played out in the context of scientific development and, and discovery. That scientific naturalism, uh, that strong push to, for example, that we see in lots of our academic circles now to accept evolution as the only true or viable view. That any kind of creationist view is just just silly nonsense that we we feel and hear that in our societies today that that that, that view of scientific naturalism is promoted with such militancy so adamantly that that I watch a show on TV and the assumption the, the philosophical assumption is an is an evolution that we assume that that's true as a society and and uh, that, that becomes a very strong influence in the way that people describe truth, describe purpose and meaning, describe fulfillment, so that our understanding of scientific progress still gets cast as a means of, of salvation or redemption, ultimately, for humans, for mankind. Uh, and um, as we move forward then, we, we, um, we run into yet another of these worldview themes or threads, these informal worldviews, and that's, that's the new age. Uh, this, the Wilkins and Sanford, again, in, in sort of a humorous way, describing the comparison that's made there, that are, are we actually gods ourselves, or, or are we God's creation? The, the new age, through I, um, their, their view of salvation of spir in spiritual terms, but not not biblical spiritual terms, kind of as we've described in the past, a secular spirituality, um, a psychic or mystical or extrasensory perception, an occultic world that allows access to salvation for a human being, that gives redemption to a human being in, in the purpose and meaning of life. That it's, a, it, it's a different uh, kind of salvation, but nonetheless, a, a description of fulfillment or meaning or purpose derived from the kind of s secular spirituality that, that is present in that, in that philosophy. And then just a couple more of these uh, as we consider the themes and threads that influence, sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly, that certainly bombard our thinking as in Western societies. One, again, is this idea of postmodern tribalism. That because postmodernism as a philosophy tends to create an environment where relativity is king and where tolerance of other ideas is the rule, interestingly and ironically enough, postmodern tribalists still are searching for the way that their story connects and creates an identity for them and relativism in itself often isn't enough to provide that salvific identity. And so what we tend to see happening is that the postmodern people, gr these groups, these societal divisions become tribal. And, and it sounds like a self-contradiction and to a large degree it is. But for example, we see in, let's say in the feminist rhetoric, that in the feminist literature, it's everywhere, really, in postmodernism, that in postmodern studies, that this feminism comes to the forefront often, and we ask ourselves, why is that? that, that that's just one of many um, spheres of ideas that, that around which people can build something. Why is that in light of the fact that, that relativity is king? Um, and we see that these, even as postmoderns, these feminists, by obligation, I think, they have to have an agenda derived from their story that creates an identity for themselves. And they, they, they believe that their oppression, let's say, has been historically connected to other philosophical views, even Christianity, they, that they would describe it that way, and that 
that people haven't been adequately tolerant of them in the past, that they haven't been adequately acceptive, accepting of their, of their place, and so they believe that their agenda needs to be promoted so that people will be more tolerant of them in the present. And they, they, we see them talking and writing in, in very militant terms about that view at times, that even though tolerance is the rule, as we've said, you don't have the right to be intolerant of me. You're required to be tolerant of my, my societal view, my subset of society. You, you don't have the right to, uh, to take issue with what it is that I want to be uh, prioritizing and valuing. And, and that sounds circular, and it tends to be circular. But toleration as a rule tends to create then these subset tribes, if you will, these postmodern tribalists that, that return us to a subdivision of society and to these, these smaller groups where people, we recognize they just absolutely cannot exist in a vacuum that's created by tolerance. It, it's not possible because of the, the human soul searching for fulfillment and meaning, playing itself out, through the vehicle of tolerance into a, a divisive or divisive process in which these subsets, these tribal groups are, are, are created, that their core identities are created in the context of society and culture because that's the way that God has made them. And so they've tied their salvific purpose or their redemptive purpose or the search for meaning and value to a, a subset identity that ironically enough came about in the context of a relativistic ethic. And so people in the process of trying to create a value-free and a neutral environment for themselves, living in, at the end of the day, their natural bent, their penchant for definition and identity, moves them toward a subset, a tribalistic scenario in a way. And we, we, we can rejoice in that as believers because that's the way God has made us. But unfortunately, when people begin to reject God as that starting point, then their salvation, by definition, will be derived in false gods, false worship, false idolatries. And, and therefore, those postmodern tribalists are finding their salvific purpose in their core identity, the one that they've created over and against this lack of tolerance that other people are showing to them. And so their identity is, is defined by the intolerance of, uh, of others in, in and of itself, which is quite a bizarre twist. But that bizarre twist defines... The, the postmodern tribalistic view and, and um, is, is a curious development that we see fairly prevalently in our societies today. And then finally, as we come to a close in describing these informal worldviews, we, we see another major development in Western society that these authors describe as salvation by therapy. They use a quotation from a, a film, uh, not, not as good as it gets, because they're describing a, a, a film where a guy, a man is dealing with psychologists and therapists trying to find a cure for his problem through therapy with the psychologists and therapists. And, and they're saying that many times in the societies where we live that we, we f define fulfillment or meaning or purpose in that therapeutic um, pursuit. In other words, people trying to reduce their salvation if they can only find the right um, psychological or, or um, the right mental formula for help and health, that they would find salvation and restoration of purpose in that process. So that, that their psyche and their psychological makeup holds the key to the kind of fulfillment that they're seeking. And we, we as spiritual beings, as, as human people created in the image of God, that we, we recognize that, uh, that our world is not built on just psychological healing as isolated from other areas of life. And these authors are, are contending in each of these worldviews that, that Christianity, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an option, as an alternative, it includes all of the elements that are described in each of these specific worldviews. But Christianity doesn't reduce life down to one of these specific areas. It doesn't, it doesn't re reduce our lives down to that first individualism, my happiness. It doesn't, it doesn't reduce life down to 
the consumerism of, of my needs being met. If I can only fulfill my, my physical needs in the right kind of way that society accepts, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be fulfilled, I'll be significant, I'll, be, I'll find meaning. It doesn't, doesn't reduce my life down. Christianity doesn't reduce life down to the security and safety that I find in, in a strong national identity like a nationalism that helps to define purpose for me. Or it doesn't reduce life down to the, the relative relationships that we would have with one another as in moral relativism. That if you treat me with the right kind of respect, then I'll find fulfillment. It doesn't reduce life down to the scientific naturalism that provides some kind of a, a trajectory of positive explanation for, for purpose and meaning in life. If we just pursue those scientific ideas, then we'll come to a place where we see meaning established. It, Christianity doesn't create a reduction in spirituality that, that, as the New Age would describe, that our sort of um, non-tangible, intangible spiritual being will eventually come to understand higher purpose. Christian life doesn't function that way. Christian theism doesn't function that way and doesn't create these postmodern tribalist subdivisions. Christian life does not do that for us. It doesn't reduce life down to my ideas encapsulated by my small social group or subset that, that then that allows me to find purpose and meaning by identifying myself in that way. Or uh, then this idea of therapy, if I could only solve the si psychological side of my problems and find balance there, then, then, uh, then, I, then purpose and meaning would be established for me. All of those themes or threads of informal worldview in our societies, they're, they're balanced. They're encapsulated in an appropriate way, in, in a non-idolatrous way, within the framework of a Christian theistic worldview. But the problem is, is that those worldviews, as, we, as we're describing, they distort the reality of life in one area or another by overemphasizing specific of those components. So as we are introduced then to this set of informal worldviews, these three threads or themes that, that do affect the way that we think about life day to day, let's, let's consider then what it would look like to begin to evaluate our, our worldview and, and the worldviews of others around us using these two kind of sets of categories of ideas. Um, for example, okay, we, take, we, we use Sire's questions. So we, we hear someone's story told or we, or we are evaluating our own story. So we're applying those seven questions, let's say the first seven questions to our story. What's prime reality and uh, what, what, what's the nature of external reality? And what's a human being? What happens to a human being as, at death? And we play our, our way through or work our way through those questions as, as we hear a story of another person told and we're able to answer them well. I, I trust that most of us would, especially as Christian theists, would be able to very clearly answer those first seven questions. Now the challenge for us becomes when we get to that eighth one in Sire's list, and you may or may not remember that, but the idea of what core commitments are manifest in our lives as a result of us answering those first seven questions. If we claim to be able to answer those first seven questions clearly, then what are the core commitments that should be the result of that? And most Christians, conservative theists, theists should be able to answer those those first seven questions, but there are times when, as we've described before, that there's a dis disconnect or a disengagement between those first seven questions and, and the actual moral outworking in our lives, that the core commitments that are manifest for us in life don't necessarily look the same as those as the, what should be the implication of the answers to those seven questions. And that's where, as we, t as we move from Sire's resource to Wilkins and Sanford, that we see that their list of, of, of themes or cultural themes, these informal worldviews, gives input or insight into the practicality of our lives. And so we can, we can look at our life and say, yes, these are the, seven, these are the answers to those seven questions that I, I would give, but wait a minute, in practice, my life looks very individualistic or, or it looks very much like I'm driven by consumerism. Or I, I see the way in which when I interact with someone from another cultural context where the walls of my national identity go right up, I, I can see myself responding with, with a kind of 
misunderstood pride in, in who I am as, as a citizen of whatever country. And so th this can challenge us in a, in a productive way to, to return to the worldview model that we described that's centered in a story, in, in our story, or in, particularly in, in God's story. And to see the way that our, our identity as individuals relates to that story and the way that our Christian allegiance should be creating for us an identity that is healthily and appropriately centered in the person of Jesus Christ, what He's done for us. And, and it doesn't, unfortunately, our, our lives inconsistently in many cases don't develop and they don't practically work themselves out that way. That Wilkins and Sanford are challenging us to answer that eight question about what, what are the core commitments that should manifest an appropriate identity for us? What are the core commitments in moral and in action that demonstrate God's story played out and worked out? How does that look? That, that's a good challenge for us as we try to apply these two frames of reference, worldview frames of reference from Sire and from Wilkins and Sanford to our lives. That this is a way that we can, we can describe our personal worldviews. It's a way that we can understand more about our core commitments, that we need to be regularly evaluating our identity in light of, of the, the themes and threads that motivate us in our cultural context and our societies. And, and as we're doing that, then we have the privilege and opportunity to more objectively evaluate other worldviews, and that, that's our goal. That's our goal as workers over in other contexts, that we, we look at animistic societies in, in a, let's say, a minority or second cultural setting, or we're in a, in a situation where we're evaluating an Islamic worldview, let's say, or when we look at naturalists around us, we, we, uh, we think about then the ways in which their, the manifestation of their lives, the core commitments that are manifest are consistent or inconsistent with, with those seven questions that they, that they claim to hold to, the answers that they claim to give, such that we can critique in a healthy way those systems of thought and, and in turn critique the ways that their lives are lived out. And now as we think about that then, and without trying to create too many layers of complexity, um, we want to we wanna give four questions that help us to correlate these two areas of thought. And again, not, not trying to be overly complex, but to help us to correlate the idea that here's a clear explanation of what I would describe as answers to those first seven questions. In other words, if you ask me what my prime reality is, I would say, no, it's God. It's God and His purposes. And, and therefore, a human being is, is this. And therefore, a human being goes to, to heaven, let's say, when they die. And therefore... The, the morals and actions that should be derived from that worldview based on God's story should look like this. And so I can clearly extrapolate that for you as a believer, as a Christian, let's say. But when you evaluate the morals and actions, the core commitments that result from that, there may be a disconnect. And in, in other of the worldviews, particularly the, either these, um, these formalized systems that James Sire talks about or these informal worldviews, we will find that very difficult that people can apply themselves um, effectively and consistently. In other words, if, if they live on the basis of this set of tenets to life, this, this, these sets of answers to the seven questions, very difficult for them to consistently live those out in core commitments and morals and actions that, that create a, a cohesion and, and, and a clarity to their lives. And so I say that to say that we want to we think about four questions that, that help to provide evaluative reference points for us as we think about people's allegiances, what they've aligned themselves with, what core key story they've aligned themselves with, and what morals and actions are an outworking of that. Four questions that we can continually ask to, to try to identify the, the coherence of the system that they're living. Our contention would be, in fact, that just as a backdrop, that Christianity is the only alternative that could provide coherence like this. And so the first question we would ask is, is, is it 
is the system that is being seen both in, in the, the theoretical or philosophical basis for what they claim to believe, let's say in a naturalistic system, and the moral commitments, the, the outworking. Is, is there consistency there rationally? Is there really a rational coherence in that system? Are those lived practice and theoretical basis or philosophical basis, are they really rationally coherent and non-contradictory? Or, or do individuals in that system hold to components that by definition or in certain senses tend to contradict themselves? For example, thinking about naturalism and, and describing rational coherence. We, we talk about... Um, this idea of a closed box, okay? So there's a box of, of, of life experience that's closed to any transcendent influence. There's no voice that can provide truth speaking into the box with any standard. And so that person, as they, they explain the reason for their core commitments, their, their morals and actions, they're going to have a very difficult time in rational coherence terms, in terms of this first question, explaining the meaning of right and wrong. They're going to have a very difficult time explaining the origin of human rationality and self-awareness in a way that doesn't ultimately contradict with that deterministic cause and effect system that they're theoretically describing and tied to, the story of life, the prime reality that they've described. They, they can't explain well in rational coherence, in terms of rational coherence, why there's a naturalistic causation and evolution that can produce beings who are self-aware, have certain kinds of values, who value certain things and don't value others, who have a sense of right and wrong and a sense of self. They can't describe the nexus or connection because their system isn't adequate to, to, to explain that process. They, they can tell you what, what should be or what can be. For example, that a lion will always kill a zebra if they have opportunity. But they can't tell you what ought to be the case. They can't get from what should be, in other words, the deterministic process to what should be, what ought to be the case, what, what ought to be done. They don't have an explanation from, from moving from what can be or what will be to what ought to be. That, that, that movement requires something other than a closed box. It requires someone speaking into the closed box. It requires, it creates the need for a kind of rational coherence in the system that isn't present. That, that there's a contradiction that's inherent built into the presuppositions of that particular worldview that what is practiced in life in, in core commitments doesn't necessarily derive from the, the story created in a naturalistic system. Now, in the kinds of contexts where we're going to work, many of us, the, in animistic contexts, we see that um, animists, they don't tend, and, and again, generalizations are sometimes not helpful, but they don't tend to, to think of their worldviews in these kinds of terms, so in what we would describe as rational coherence. There, there are what we would say or describe a, as contradictions in reason in the animistic worldviews. I, I note I've noted some in the, in the ones that I've been exposed to. Um, for, for example, uh, the, a story of, of the, the animists, some guys have told me that a plant can hear and therefore be influenced by the actions of human beings. Um, and yet, when we see that plant and see the way it grows and functions, we, we don't see evidence of that being not being contradictory. It seems contradictory to life experience that that's the case. And, and yet, animists perform many rituals and ceremonies, oftentimes, in, in, in what would seem to be contradiction to, to a system that... Um, that, that we would say represents the reality of, of our life experience worked out, that it's not reasonable to believe in, in those terms. But nonetheless, um, even if we're working just as, as a, a point of reference, if we're working in an animistic society, we still pr press and, and strive to, to evaluate the system accor according to its rational coherence. We want to know that that, that worldview is manifesting a non-contradiction.
that, that um, closed systems tend to produce an incoherence and some of the open systems like animistic systems can as well. And so it, this first evaluative question of four, is the system rationally coherent? Does it cohere to, to in reason to all that, that, that we would take in from the theory to the core commitments that are manifest in the lives of people? Number two, then, a second evaluative question as we try to apply these worldview frameworks to our lives and to the lives of others around them, around us and around those we work with. Is the system, is this worldview system empirically correspondent to reality? Does it, does it cover the whole of life in an adequate way? We've referred briefly already to the idea that that worldviews, some worldviews tend to reduce or absolutize certain aspects of life experience. Like the ones Wilkins and Sanford talked about that, that reduce salvation or the mean, meaning or fulfillment to a, a specific component of human life. Like the, the healthy psycho, psychological person. Or in the New Age case, a, a certain kind of secular spirituality. Or, or the national identity or, or the tribalistic identity that's postmodern or, or individual fulfillment, self, self, uh, the self-focused uh, individualism or, or consumerism. So, so we've described already the, the potential for reducing life to these certain areas, but ultimately that those worldview systems are not providing an adequate coverage of all the empirical data. In, all, in other words, all of the data points that life takes in as we observe and examine, explore life as a whole, that those reference points are not adequately covered in certain of these worldview systems. And, you know, those worldviews, we, we talk about them as plans of salvation in a sense. Those of us who are Christians recognize the idea of a plan of salvation the way that God intended to redeem us, but, but these worldviews too are, are ways of trying to redeem people back from the problems, really, of pain and suffering in life, the, the, the discomforts of life. And so science is making that claim that they can solve life's problems. They're, they're systems of salvation and redemption. And, and what we're saying is that they're not sufficiently covering, as systems of salvation or redemption, these other worldviews are not sufficiently covering all of the empirical data. They're failing in areas of reality to explain the whole in an adequate way. For example, um, a system like naturalism fails to explain the, the existence of evil. They, they, don't, they don't have a... They, there are data points, many data points in life, about the existence of evil that, we, that register on our scope that naturalism can't explain. They can't explain why evil exists and what evil is and why some things are moral and why some things are not moral. They can't explain that. And, and so in a Christian system, however, we, we see the ability of the existence of God and His creative process of, of creating sinless beings and giving choice to them, that their choices lead them to rebel against Him, that God wasn't the creator of evil, but evil resulted as a consequence of the choices that were made by those that God created. And so there's an explanation to those data points in terms of the existence of evil that many systems don't have. They can't explain the absolutes or the sense, the conscience of right and wrong that a human being has. They can't explain truth. They can't even explain knowledge and why we know certain things and don't know other things, and why we can know. And so we would say, then, in, in re relationship to this second question, that many, in fact all, of the other worldview systems, whether they're the informal ones or whether they're the formal categories that James Sire described, that they are unable to address all of the data points that are a part of empirical reality, the, 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 the sense sensory reality that we live in as, as human beings. So are our systems rationally coherent? Are the, are the systems we're encountering rationally coherent? Do they correspond well to 
the empirical data to the reality that we see to cover the whole of life, not to leave out major areas, but to cover the whole of life in, in, a, in a, a sufficient way, in an adequate way. And then number three of four here, as we move forward, are, are those systems what we would describe as existentially co consistent? In other words, are they livable and functional? Can you live that way? Is, is, it, is it possible to live consistently in light of those underpinnings, in light of those theoretical tenets, in light of the answer to those first seven questions? Now, we've already said, and I don't think we have to reiterate much, that it's difficult to live a fulfilled life on the base, basis that naturalism or relativism create. For nihilism, for example, that, that an adequate response is the futility of suicide. Because if there's no meaning to reality, there, there's no reason why I should respect and love my wife and children as opposed to abusing them. There, there's no reason why I should follow the, abide by a law and drive on one side of the road as opposed to another. I, I should be able to just do what I want and whatever I want to do is meaningless anyway. There's no reason why I should avoid running my car off a cliff as opposed to trying to maintain my place on the road. And as we feel our way into that philosophy of life, there, there's a reasonlessness to it and, and creates a sense of futility. And what we're claiming here in this question is that it's not, it's not possible to live a meaningful life in that way. That it's not possible to, to live a life that that uh, provides fulfillment while at the same time claiming that there, there's, no, there's no meaning, that there, there's, no, there's no point. It's the same with relativism, that, that we're forced, by life experience, we're forced to live a system of truth, a system of right and wrong. There, there's no way around it. But, but, but at the same time, the theoretical basis for relativism would claim there's, there is no such thing as right and wrong or truth. You know, it's one, one, I think of the remark made by one philosopher. He said <clears throat> that even in India, where and that's where he was from, that's his country of origin, where people are claiming that truth is relative. And, and so people are applying themselves to saying that the philosophical system that's in place there claim, is manifest in relativism. And he, he made the wry remark that even there in that country, if you cross the street and there's a bus coming, that either you get out of the way of the bus or you stand in the way of the bus, and if you stand in the way, you're going to get killed. That, that law of non-contradiction, it's not negotiable in life experience. And many of these worldview systems that we're describing that are non-Christian, all of them, in fact, set up certain levels of tension and contradiction that become existentially inconsistent, that are not livable and functional, that they're not adequate to describe and define existence for us. And then finally, moving from the existential consistence to the idea of uh, asking, really, in each of these systems that we encounter, is, is the system emotively compelling? Does, it, does, does the system address the heart level questions that we as human beings ask. Is it, is it really challenging our, our soul, our, our inner person, our inner being in, in an adequate way? Now we've, we've already stated that, uh, that as Cyrus explained that questions about meaning and truth and right and wrong, the, the whys of human existence, those are questions that human beings ask time and time again around the world. That from culture to culture, from age to age, from, from, from one set of circumstances or one kind of a living environment to another, that those questions continue to be asked. And those questions aren't, they're not just intellectual questions. They're, they're questions that are motivated by the heart of a person seeking answers to the practical life experience that they're encountering, many times in, in, in the area of pain and suffering. Or, or lack of fulfillment, or lack of completion. And, and some worldviews have a significant gap in answering any of those kinds of heart-level questions that would provide us, at the end of the day, with a true sense 
of, of meaningfulness, that, that the, the place where they lead is just to futility and meaninglessness. And we, we've described that in light of nihilism, for example, a sense of nonsense, a sense of nonsense which sounds like an oxymoron, a sense of, of chaos, that, that worldview systems need, should be emotively compelling because that addresses the heart level of a human being in an adequate way. And so as we apply ourselves then to the exploration and evaluation of the practical commitments that are manifest in our worldviews and in the worldviews of others around us, and as we correlate those core commitments, the morals and actions, to the theoretical basis of a worldview in a given setting, these four questions uh, help to help us to explore the coherence of the systems that we'll encounter. They help us to, to begin to identify areas where that system is inadequate to truly cover the whole of life in, in the way that God intended through His great story for us. <music>